How are you feeling? Um, so this is the day a lot of pastors really dread. It's the day after the hour jumps forward. And you always wonder, is anyone going to show up at church on time? Or, or are people even going to be awake during the service today? Are you awake? No, you're not. That doesn't sound like it at all. <laughs> All right, so anyhow, we're here um, at church today, and we're going through a series uh, preparing us for Easter. It's our Lent series, and we're talking about giving up. We're talking about giving up uh, things, and in Lent, uh, again, we talked about Lent a bit, and we talk about the very fact that in Lent, you give up uh, certain things in life to remind you of your mortality, uh, to focus maybe some time and energy on Christ, on, on your relationship with Jesus, or even in generosity. So some people will give up, you know, eating chocolate for a period of 40 days. Some of, I know Pastor Enoch, he's given up give, watching YouTube over the next 40 days, right? And so instead of spending money on chocolate, maybe you'd give up that money and, and give it to the poor. Or, you know, now that you're not watching YouTube, you would spend that time maybe reading the Bible Bible or doing something of benefit for the kingdom of God. And so uh, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the season of Lent. But for us in this sermon series, we're not talking about just giving up something for 40 days. We're talking about giving up some things um, that are really going to be helpful for our life. Uh, and so we've been talking about giving up control. We've talked about giving up our expectations. Uh, and today, uh, as we're here, we're going to talk about giving up our superiority, and when you hear that, uh, I'm not sure what exactly is going through your head when you hear, what does it mean to give up superiority? Um, and, and there's a lot of things to it, but what I want to just say to you is that as we're going to look today, there are various facets of superiority. We all walk around with some form of a superiority complex. Uh, we walk around and we often um, think we are better than we really are or we hope we are better than we really are. And especially what we do is when we compare ourselves to someone else, we definitely want to feel better about ourselves, and it's sometimes at the expense uh, of another person. And so we're going to look at Scripture today. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open it up, turn it on uh, to John chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible um, and you want one, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will grab one for you. And, and you know what? If you want, you can keep that Bible. It's for you to keep uh, so that you can read God's Word. So we're in um, John chapter 4. And this is the story of Jesus meeting a woman at a well. Now, I want to give you some backdrop to this because we're going to talk about um, superiority and how it looks for uh, Jesus in this time and how it applies to us today. And, and there are various ways in which we're going to tackle um, this issue of superiority. And, and the first thing that I want to give to you is that as Jesus is, is doing what he's doing today in this story, um, there's a very, very interesting thing that maybe many of us overlook. Okay? Uh, we, we're not really quite sure unless you have a really good cultural context of what's going on. And so Jesus is in the middle of, of this town called Sakar. He's sitting by a well. And one of the things is that he enters this town. Now, he's traveling, and as he's traveling, as a good Jew, he would have avoided this town. You know, sometimes when you grow up, you hear about the wrong side of the tracks, right? Or uh, you want to make sure you avoid certain neighborhoods, right? Because that neighborhood is considered bad. Uh, some of you are still like that. You're afraid to go to downtown Toronto. It's like, ooh, scary place. It's just all condos. Don't worry, right? But if I gave us the context, right? If I said um, Malvern, some of you would hear something. If I said Jane and Finch, some of you would hear something. Okay? And, and so um, Jesus is going through this town, and it's not, the nor it's not the normal route. In fact, it would be the faster route if they goes through this town. But a lot of the Jews at that time avoided going through this town because of cultural superiority. Cultural superiority. Because they believed that as Jews, they were better than Samaritans. So what is a Samaritan? A Samaritan for them, they're, they're um, in, in our Bible. These are people who are uh, intermarried with Jewish people and with other races. It started happening in the time of the Babylonian Empire when, when the Jews were exiled from their land and they started living in the land of Babylon and you know, one or two Jews would, would marry someone from that culture and that race and it continued on through the Assyrians and the Persian empires and so Jews were marrying, intermarrying with these other cultures and these other races and Jews wanted to stay exclusively Jewish 
culturally. And these Samaritans were what we call half-breeds. It's, it's like some of us here who have, we have biracial children, right? They're half Chinese and they're half something, or they're half something and something else. And these Samaritans were looked upon um, as an inferior group of people. And so the Jews, being good Jews to themselves, they said, we don't want to associate with these kinds of people, so we will actually take the long route to avoid them. But Jesus already started the process by going through this town, and not only does he go through this town, he ends up sitting and waiting in this town. And and so for us today, one of the challenges that we have in our day and age today is the challenge of cultural superiority. Every one of us struggles with this. Uh, Every culture out there believes that their culture is the best culture out there. there. You don't have to look farther than the Olympics and the World Cup of soccer, do you? Because in in the wonderful GTA that we live in, in the Greater Toronto area, once the World Cup hits, you know, you have flags and flags of people's countries and their cultures, right? So you have Brazil, and people are supporting Portugal, and people are supporting, um, I don't know, because I don't watch soccer, uh, Trinidad, Tobago, right? They just, they just, they throw up all these flags. And when you're watching the Winter Olympics or when you're watching the Summer Olympics, right, you're watching for certain countries because you think our country is the best. And so Canada surpassed their medal total from back in Whistler, right? And we were like, yeah, it's great to be Canadian. And then others of us were cheering for whatever culture you cheer for. Some of us, it was cheering for the, the Koreans and their speed skating. Some of us were cheering for the Americans and their figure skating. And some of us were cheering for hockey as Canadians and J- Japanese for their whatever else they do, right? Um, so we all have this in us. And it's not far in the last century that we have examples of cultural superiority that leads to genocide, right? The most prominent one for all of us is usually Adolf Hitler, who wanted to create the super race and started World War II as a result. But you also have what happened in Bosnia with, uh, with the, the ethnic cleansing, in Rwanda with ethnic cleansing. You have it happen in... in um, Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge, right? And, and so our century has been filled with bloodshed based upon cultural superiority. And, and Jesus reminds us of a very simple thing today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not exclusive to any one people group. And if really we call ourselves Christians, we cannot and will not and we should not and we shall not ever believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is only for one particular cultural group because then we would fall into the same trap as what the Jews had to go through here with this story in Samaria. Now, I look in this room, okay, and uh, this past week, um, the pastors, we were having a meeting, the English pastors, so Jordan, Sonia, Enoch, myself, we were sitting together. Uh, Sonia asked a very interesting question. She said, what do you think the ethnic makeup is in our, in our congregation? And I said, I, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, how many do you, people in the congregation would identify themselves as Chinese? And I said, you've got to really think about this question because this question is hard. And the reason why this question is hard, uh, Sonia, is that I, I looked at her, I said, Sonia, do you consider me Chinese? She says, yes, I would consider you Chinese. And I said, I don't consider myself Chinese. I was born in Canada, raised in Canada. I don't have a Chinese name in my driver's license. It's an English name. It's Kenneth Colin Fu. Like, it's just, I, you know, I don't have that. My kids don't have anything. Chi- my, my parents didn't really raise us to be Chinese. They, they forced us one year at Chinese school, and they knew how bad we were at it. They said, we were not going to waste our time and energy on that. Right? So I said, Sonia, I, I don't even consider myself Chinese, even though I may look Chinese, but I, Sonia, I consider you Chinese. <laughs> and if you don't know Sonia, Sonia's Caucasian, right? But she speaks Mandarin and she understands the culture. Uh, me, I'm culturally deficient in understanding some of these things that go on. What is Chinese New Year? All I know is I receive. That's it. I receive. <laughs> I don't give. I'm Chinese. I, 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 I'm Chinese enough not to give, but I'm Chinese enough to receive, you know, like, like that. So, uh, you know, and I, and I said, you know, in our, in our church, we have people from Peru. We have people from, we have a 
we have, I want to say Kiwi, I shouldn't say Kiwi, sorry Sarah, I, from New Zealand, right? Um, and, and we have people from all over the place, from Mauritia to Mauritius and from Malaysia and you name it, we've got it. It's, it's interesting. So, um, so out of curiosity, just to satisfy Jordan, myself, Enoch, and Sonia, in this room, if you, do, if you ethnically identify yourself as Chinese, would you, and you take that for whatever you think it means, would you raise your hand? Okay, and if you don't associate yourself ethnically as Chinese, would you raise your hand? And, and you know what? We're one of those unique congregations, I think. Yeah, that's about 20%, man. <laughs> that's about 20% of our congregation who does not consider themselves ethnically Chinese. That's unique, right? And, and I think that gives us um, an advantage or even an opportunity. Uh, if you weren't here during our annual general meeting, uh, Deacon Paul raised up a very challenging uh, notion. And I, I, if you were there, great. If you weren't there, you missed out on a very, very heartfelt uh, discussion that he initiated. And he asked the question uh, in that meeting, that we need to start considering whether Mississauga Chinese Baptist Church, the name of this church, will continue on anymore. And this discussion is at a high level right now in your leadership team, where we are constantly talking about vision, strategy, reaching out, and we live in a city in which only 4% of the people identify that their language is Chinese. We live in a city where 3.8% of people identify their, their language as Arabic, people in the city who identify their language as Polish, people in the city who identify their, their language as Urdu. We live in a very multicultural city, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is for everyone. And we would be really doing a disservice to the gospel if we raise up our cultural superiority and say, no, the gospel is only for a select group of people culturally. And it's time that many of our ethnic churches uh, in the greater Toronto area are struggling with this and they're challenging this with the Filipino church, the Vietnamese church, even Middle East Baptist church, one of our close sister churches down the street. They're all challenged with this very notion that can we still say that the gospel really needs to only appeal to a certain cultural group or do we really need to embrace what Jesus said that it's for everyone? After all, he said what? Go and make disciples of all nations. And when you get to the book of Revelation and when you see the people gathered at the throne room of Christ and you see them standing there in worship, it is from every tribe, language, group of people, right? And we live in this city and this city is a wonderful city because it's not, um, it's not a pocket like in a lot of the other cities in, in the greater Toronto area. You have this wonderful opportunity to reach people of so much cultural diversity. Right? We're not in Richmond Hill where it is predominantly Chinese. We're not in, in Scarborough where it can be predominantly Chinese, but we live in Mississauga in which, again, there are people groups who identify by language. There's Chinese, there's Urdu, there's uh, Arabic, there's Polish, there's, there's all kinds. And that's why we said in our mission, in our vision statement for our church, we said we want to reach all peoples with the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. And so I hope it's something that that you embrace because I think it is also what Jesus challenged his own disciples with when we look at this, to give up our cultural superiority, to think that we are better because of a certain ethnicity that we carry and to say, no, it's not about that. And so for some of us, we will need to, to put down uh, our, our maybe Asian pride. Uh, for some of us, we will have to put down um, the very fact that we're used to certain smells and certain looks and certain colors Right? And we would have to put aside a lot of that. And not only that, we would have to take up the very fact that we would probably need to be educated to know how to speak um, Arabic to a person, to greet them, to greet them with the gospel, or to, to maybe understand Southeast Asian culture so that we can share the gospel, to understand what people are going through uh, who have a cultural diversity that is much different from ours. And it's hard. And you know what? I would always say this. It's hard for Asian people to do this because for thousands of years, China was such a closed country, right? Right? You didn't see other ethnicities. You didn't understand that that was... And we're in Canada where it's been an open door for everyone to come. 
And it causes us to have to learn and educate ourselves uh, with cultural, a cultural intelligence, I would say, or a cultural quotient. And see, Jesus gave that example to us that he put down his cultural superiority, put it down for someone else. Not only did he do that, another way in which he, he completely destroyed their cultural superiority was who was he talking to? Someone comes along to the well and he looks at the person and he, he speaks. And what we're told is that she's a Samaritan woman. Not only is it the, the cultural thing, there's a gender thing there. And we're living this day and age right now. If you haven't noticed in, in all our media, right? Me too, right? Hashtag me too, yes. You understanding that? Uh, hashtag time's up, right? Uh, and, and let's face it, I'm a man. I stand up here before you, but we live in a, in, in, a, in a culture in which we're talking about what it really means now for gender equality, that women and men who have the same jobs, performing the same tasks, are they getting paid the same Right? And, and so and we're talking about the abuses of power and things like that. And, and Jesus, he takes his culture and he takes this gender thing and he blows it out of the water because, one, he's talking to a woman in which he would never do that back then. You don't just uh, suddenly randomly, because there's a, 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 a level of just distance you're supposed to keep from women as men. You don't know if she's someone else's husband. You don't know uh, what her marital status is. And it just looks bad if you're just talking to her. And he throws that out the window. Not only that, he throws out the culture and says, I know she's a Samaritan woman on top of that. She's got double whammy on her. And he throws that out and he says, will you give me something to drink? And she looks at him. She's shocked, right? If you read your scripture, she's completely floored. She looks at him. "Um, I thought we don't associate with each other. She doesn't, know, she doesn't even know what to say. She's so caught off guard. And, and so this is Jesus saying as well, just, just take that cultural superiority, take that gender superiority, just put it aside because the gospel is for everyone. What Jesus has to bring is for everyone. And, and so he stands there and he just says, give me something to drink. And, and she's so puzzled. She's like, wait, 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 what's going on here? You don't even have something to, to take the water out of a well. I'm not even sure what you're asking of me. And so Jesus starts this dialogue with her, and he starts to share with her about the fact that, you know, you're going to drink this water, you're still going to be thirsty, but I have something different that I could give you that you will never thirst again. And she gets excited. She's like, what is it? I want it. What is that? And he talks about living water. He talks about the Spirit of God. He talks about himself. He talks about the kingdom of God. And she's getting excited and more excited about it. Now, So we've talked about the very fact that we have a lot of times in our own heads this cultural superiority or maybe even a gender superiority in the way we do things. And then we say the gospel needs to penetrate all of that. The gospel will penetrate all of that. And we need to challenge ourselves that the gospel would penetrate those things. Here's another thing with this woman. She comes out in the middle of the day. Now, there's a reason for that. See, you don't come out in the middle of the day to get your water. It's too hot. Um, the half the day is gone. I mean, again, it's not like, like us today where you walk to the washroom, turn on a tap, and it, you, know, you got water. They had to take enough water for their day. And she's already half lost the day in daylight. She's half gone. Uh, so she didn't have water for breakfast. She didn't have water to clean herself in the morning. She's coming in the afternoon. Why? And there's some of us hear the story, and we, we know that it's because she's missing out on what's going on in the morning. Why is she missing out on what's going on? Because she's maybe ostracized. She's ostracized. She can't go out in the morning. Do you know why? Because when Jesus asks her, bring me your husband, she says, I don't have one. And she's like, yeah, you've actually had five. Now, we need to pull this out a bit more because there's a cultural thing that's going on. Now, when you hear that, some of us are going to hear certain things. Some of us are maybe hearing, um... What do you mean five husbands? Is she, is she having, like, an affair? Oh, what do you mean five husbands? Like, does she get divorced and remarried and divorced, remarried? Or is she one of those who sleeps around? You know, one of the really challenging things about this passage is that when Jesus identifies that she's had five husbands, and, and she's also doing this in the middle of the day where none of the other ladies are around, Oftentimes, a lot of us will jump to when Jesus uh, encountered the woman who was caught in adultery. 
We jump to that passage in our heads, some of us, and, and you know, they, they find a woman caught in adultery, they bring her to Jesus, and, they, and then everyone says, you know, we found her caught in adultery, what should we do? The law says, you know, she should die, and Jesus said, okay, sure, um, any of you here who has no sin, why don't you throw the first stone, right? And we just think adultery. There's one thing that Jesus doesn't talk about here with her. He doesn't talk about her sin, and he doesn't talk about her sinning no more. Do you notice that? I mean, the woman caught in adultery, he says, you know, go ahead, throw the first stone. But when everyone walks away, he still looks at her and he says, you know, go and sin no more. Is there a sin issue with her because she's had five husbands? Well, let me pull this out apart a bit for you. How do you have five husbands in that day and age? Well, firstly, maybe she got married, and one of the things that happens when you get married is that you get married to a husband. And back in those days, it's not like today. If you wanted to get a divorce, it wasn't the woman who could get a divorce. A woman could not get a divorce in those days. In fact, a man could get a divorce for any reason he wanted to. So it's possible, it's quite possible that this woman got divorced by her man because the man just said, you know what, you burnt my eggs, woman, get out. It's even quite possible that she was in a, such an abusive situation in which her husband treated her like garbage and finally found another woman and said, you know what, I'm through with you, just pack up and go. And rather than look at it with a moral superiority that says, is she a sinner that many of us would jump to? We need to lay down our moral superiority and look at her brokenness. She's a woman who's been kicked to the curb five times. Now, that's one way in which she could have had five husbands, that the husband doesn't want her anymore. I mean, think of it in your own lives. If your spouse all of a sudden, you know what? I don't want you anymore. And many of us would look at a divorced person and say, oh, you know, the stigma of it. And we just go, oh, you're divorced? Oh, you should stay over there. There's a brokenness to her. There's a brokenness to the person in your own church who's going through a divorce. And rather than stand here with a moral superiority, Jesus says, I'm listening. I'm here. He never condemns anything there. The second way that she could have five husbands is that her husband died. And if the husband dies and she has no children, which we kind of can see in this maybe, she actually becomes the husband to the brother. Sorry, the wife to the brother. And so it's possible that her husband has died. And she's grieving. She's a widower. But many of us in our moral superiority, we think of a single woman, we think, oh, there's something wrong with her. Jesus is saying, no. So it's it's, it's quite more than likely that it's not a sin issue she's dealing with here. And the one she's with right now is not her husband. It's possible because maybe the husband did die and she's with her brother, her brother-in-law. And the only reason why she's there is not a usual husband and wife relationship. It's just for the protection of the woman. And so this is a cultural thing that's going on too, that that she's got all this baggage of not having a man in her life, of having five different men in her life. But you see, many of us, when we hear that, we'll think of a moral superiority. We've got to lay that down. We look at other people and the stuff going on in their lives, and we've just got to be able to say, you know what? The gospel needs to reach into that. I need to lay down my moral superiority like Jesus did here. And that's hard. I'm not saying give up your standards. I'm not saying give up the Bible and it's when it calls out sin. I'm not saying that. But you can't reach people if you stand morally superior to them. Last week when we looked at the Bible, we were looking through John chapter 3. And John chapter 3.16 uh, was one of the most famous verses in the Bible that everyone knew, right? Uh, it's no longer the most famous verse in the Bible. It's from Matthew 7 when it says, Judge not lest ye be judged. That became the most popular verse now. Because the world is broken, people are hurting, and all they ever receive is moral superiority from church. There's a time and a place to call people out on moral superiority. There's a time and a place to call sin out. But this is Jesus' encounter with a woman here who's broken and needs to hear the gospel. And the gospel needs to penetrate through all that. So church, what is it going to look like when we talk and bring people to this place who have no understanding of church, who live a lifestyle completely different from what you understand. 
Uh, back, back a while ago, we were talking about reaching people in one of the categories. There were two categories that I wanted to share with you, right? They were called nuns and they were called duns. The nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not nuns with hab, you know, like Roman Catholic nuns, right? They're nuns as in people who have no church background. Do you know how many people have, who have no church background, they live a life that's completely different from ours, right? I mean, they're, they're doing things that are completely different from what we're used to and accustomed to. They speak a certain way that's completely different. They, do, they have actions that are completely different. And, and, and a lot of times, if we're in the sitting in the seat of judgment and sitting in the seat of moral superiority, we would look upon them and say, ew, please don't come to my church. How many of you have a coworker that you know just lives completely wild and you just want to have nothing to do with them? And Jesus says, no, look, the gospel is for that person. You know, we, there's people who, um, you know, they, they will come to this church. They, they don't have that background. They, they grew up not knowing that, you know, the Bible talks about marriage uh, a certain way. And they've been, you know, sleeping around. And we can just harp on, their moral, on our moral superiority. And yes, there will be a time for that. But to bring the gospel into their life first. To see them as Jesus would see them. To see the brokenness. To see what they're missing. Why are they sleeping around? Because a lot of times, they're looking for something. They're looking for someone to love them. Who is the one that really, really loves them? It's Jesus. But if we stood on our moral superiority and gave that first, would they hear Jesus? Would they see Jesus? Would they be able to receive Jesus? It's hard. It's a hard balancing act to deal with that. And this is how Jesus did it. And you know what I really love about this passage when we talk about, you know, cultural superiority, moral, moral superiority? When the woman hears about Jesus, when the woman understands who Jesus is, she totally forgot about the water. She totally forgot why she was even there. It says she put down her jar and she ran into town. She became a huge evangelist in that town because of this amazing encounter she had with Jesus. People in that town received Jesus because of her testimony. The church is supposed to be a place full of broken people, full of sick people. It's a spiritual hospital. It is a moral hospital. It is an ethical hospital. It is for all the gross, dirty, disgusting people. Do you know why I know that? Because we're here, aren't we? And if, if we ever were approached with the Christian faith with this same cultural superiority or moral superiority, we wouldn't even be sitting here. And Jesus gives us that grace to say, pass that on, would you? I'm showing you what this looks like. And this woman was looking for all kinds of things in life. She found it all in Jesus. There are people that God has put in your life. You're not, you're not in your neighborhood by accident. You're not in your workplace by accident. You're not in your school by accident. God has put you there because there are people there like this woman who will need the gospel to penetrate their life. Our superiority needs to be brought down. Our pride, our, our thinking that we're better because Christianity No one can claim that. None of us could ever claim that we are better. We only point people to the one who's the best, and that's Jesus. And so this is the story of how Jesus challenged superiority. And, you know, there's there's just so much to it that we can, there's so much more levels to it. I'm already completely out of time. Is that even right? Yeah, that is right. You know, like, but my hope today is that you continue to allow this challenge to embrace people with the eyes of Jesus Christ. This past week, uh, as pastors, we were at a conference, and just a, it was just such a simple reminder that we just need to see people the way God sees people. And it's just that simple. I mean, when Jesus would look at the crowds, he had so much compassion on them. He says, you know, they're lost. They're, they need me. They need a shepherd. And we would look upon people and look at the same way that they're broken. They're just, they just need Jesus. But for many of us, we've, we've forgotten that. and We've taken up in a seat of judgment. Ew. Look at that. Look at them. Did you know what's going on in their life? And Jesus said, yeah, 
I know what's going on. And I brought you there so that they could have me through you. So would you pray with me this morning? God, in your mercy, we, uh, we need you, oh God, to bring about a conviction in our lives that if there is any ounce of superiority that we have of ourselves, that again, Lord, you would remind us to lay that down. I thank you for the example of Jesus. It's such a straightforward example of, of, of how he just loved uh, on this woman. And I pray that you would remind us again of what that is for us. The very fact that you loved us, you, you called us, you already brought us into that relationship. Not so that we could lord it over people. No, because you loved us. And that love you have for us is, is for everyone out there with whatever the issues may be, whether they're, they're black or white or South Asian or Latino or Asian or whatever, God, that your love is for them. And even whatever the walk of life that they're on, whether they're married or single or divorced or living together or, or whatever it is, God, that your love is for them. And so, Lord, for us here, God, if we need to change our attitude, I pray that that is a Holy Spirit matter, that you would melt the hardest of hearts today. Give us an eye transplant today so that we would see people the way you see them, to love on them in the way that you've loved on them. And this is only possible, God, by you, by your spirit. So we need you, God, to do this. And so today and throughout this week, as we go about our lives, Lord, we proclaim that we need you to be able to see this and do this. And so it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.